Thank you so much uh, for having me here. And it's also exciting to be here because in, in talking to all of you, I can say without a hint of hyperbole that I'm speaking to the richest generation in the history of the richest nation in the history of the world. Um, it cannot be stressed enough how much your generation is going to achieve in the future in terms of huge living standard advances that transform our lives for the much, much better. Uh, it cannot be stressed enough how much uh, your generation will transform the lives of the formerly disabled, thus allowing them to lead increasingly normal lives. And then some of you will not pursue this at all, will pursue a, a nonprofit route. Your ability to help those who can't help themselves is going to be amazing. And so I say this as a jumping off point to beg you to be optimistic about what's ahead. Uh, you have every reason to be. Uh, no doubt going forward, there will be periods of, of slower economic growth. Some people call them recessions. And the comment will be that your generation is going, is going to have to face a life of austerity, of lower living standards. Don't believe it. Uh, your achievements ultimately will make uh, past generations look small by comparison. And I base this on American history. If you look throughout our history, it gets better and better all the time. Professor Thompson and I actually had a discussion about this just now. Um, I'm more of an optimist than, than he is on this. But, but history, I think, does point upward. And, and that speaks to what an, an amazing future for all of you. Um, now, to give you a sense of why I believe this, it's worthwhile to travel back in time to the 1970s just to offer some perspective on how far we've come. Now, in thinking about the 70s, um, I'll ask a rhetorical question. How many of you have mobile phones? Um, I think I know the answer. What's interesting about that is in the 1970s, they did not exist. If you wanted to make a phone call back then, it was on a landline that you plugged into a wall. And if you wanted to own what was called a telephone, uh, it was illegal. You had to rent it from the government's preferred monopoly, at which point if you wanted to make a call from, from Clemson to Greenville, South Carolina, it was going to be very expensive to do. Um, I assume all of you have been on airplanes before. The reason I ask is that in the 1970s, it was not unheard of. It was frequently the norm to be asked that question. Most people hadn't flown. Uh, back then, air travel was in Soviet Union style by the Civil Aeronautics Board in Washington, D.C. And so huge barriers to entry into the airline space. It was very expensive. It was something that very few people did. When all of you graduated, from college, you'll be traveling all the time on weekends just to see friends, not to mention all the travel you'll do for work. Uh, in the 70s, they would have called you seriously jet set. Um, I'm guessing most of you have never waited hours and hours in line to buy gasoline. Well, in the 1970s, that was the norm. It's not as though gasoline was scarce back then. In fact, what happened is the political class, after overseeing the devaluation of the dollar that led to a spike in oil prices, they imposed price controls to fix their own error. And so in Southern California, where I grew up, it was quite literally illegal on even days to go to the gas station on an, on, on an, on an, if your license plate ended in an odd number and vice versa. And then, of course, the top tax rate in the 1970s was 70%. I bring this up because I assume most of you are here at Clemson to get a job. Ultimately, you will be high earners. Imagine if, the top, if, you're, if you faced a top tax rate of 70%. And so it's all a long or short way of saying that we became very stupid in the 1970s and it showed up in slow economic growth. But we learn the, the lessons from that. And, and, and we're much better off as a result. Uh, and that's what my first book, Popular Economics, makes a case about. I make an argument that economic growth is easy, that nothing could be simpler. And it's rooted in the freedom that you hear about in the Lyceum program. Free people prosper. It's that simple, and, and, and the way I explain it in the book is, is, is not through chart, charts and graphs and equations. I explain it through movies and television and sports. My belief, my view is that everyone in this room intimately knows economics. The problem is they've historically had it taught to them in, in the completely wrong way. Um, my take is that if you can observe the world around you, you know economics much better than 99.9% .9 of economists who, who basically hide behind uh, charts and equations rather than just showing the beauty of life, the beauty of what happens when people are free. 
And so popular economics makes the point that if we remove the four main governmental barriers to production, you can get endless opportunity. And so what are those barriers? Well, the first one is taxation. Uh, taxes are nothing more than a price or a penalty placed on work. And so in an ideal world, the top tax rate would be as low as possible. Why would you penalize people for getting up and going to work? Now, within taxation, there's, there's all sorts of different taxes, but the two other main ones, the second main one, I would say, is the tax on capital gains. Uh, that is a price or penalty placed on investment success. There are no companies and no jobs without investment first, so in an ideal world, that rate would be zero. Why on earth would you penalize people for saving and investing? And then the third main tax, and this is something that Republicans and Democrats would prefer us not to talk about, is government spending itself. To me, this is the ultimate tax. And let me be clear, this is not me talking about budget deficits or budget surpluses. I don't even consider those. I think that's a waste of time and it obscures the, the discussion. Government spending is the problem. Doesn't matter how politicians get it because when governments spend, that amounts to Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy and Chuck Schumer and Barack Obama and Donald Trump allocating the economy's resources rather than Jeff Bezos or, or Bill Gates or Fred Smith of FedEx. And so our freedom declines as the economy's resources are allocated by politicians rather than talented people like you and talented entrepreneurs in the real economy. The next barrier to economic growth and production is regulation. Let's get it out of the way. Regulation does not work and it can never work. With regulation, you're asking those who could not get jobs in energy, pharmaceuticals, finance, banking, medicine, you name it, to police those who could. And invariably, they fail. To believe that regulation works, you'd have to believe that Furman could regularly beat the Clemson Tigers in football. It's a laugh line and we know why it is. The talent disparity between the two schools is too massive for that ever to work. Well, that's how you should view regulators. Those are the people who could not get into those industries and you're expecting them to see into the future and detect trouble spots and fix things ahead of time. The very notion reeks of conceit that only governments could conceive of. Which leads us to the third barrier to production, which is floating money values. Let's be clear about what this is. This is not wealth. If we burned up every dollar in the world today, the U.S. would still be the richest country in the world tomorrow. We are the wealth. You are the massive wealth in our future. You are the producers of the goods and services that constitute wealth. All money is is an agreement about value among producers that allows us to exchange what we produce with one another. I've got bread, I want your wine, you want the butcher's meat. Money is what we use to put a value on what we bring to the market so that we can exchange it with one another. And so the way to think about money that floats around in value is the, way, is the best way to think of it is to, to imagine a restaurant kitchen in which the, the, the amount of heat and a degree of heat were changing all the time every single day. Where the, the size of a tablespoon were constantly changing. Where the length of a minute was a moving target on a daily basis. If so, there'd be chaos in that kitchen on the way to inedible food emerging from it. And that's all that unstable money, that's what unstable money does to an economy. It's the ultimate immoral act because we produce to get dollars exchangeable for something else, yet government moves around the value of that dollar on the way to us being robbed of our work, but robbed of, of, of an, a, a, an explicit measure that enables us to exchange with one another and invest with one another. Which brings us to the fourth barrier to production and prosperity, and that's tariffs on foreign goods. Think once Clemson. Presumably you're here to exchange your degree for a, for a job. And so your job will represent your demand for all that you don't have in the real economy. You will go to work and you'll exchange the paycheck that you get for your apartment rent, for the car you drive, for the mobile phone you use, for the restaurants you go to. And what does that tell you? It tells you hopefully that no one, when a market is open to all producers, foreign and domestic, it just means with, when trade is free in your country that you have not just people in your country competing to serve your needs. It means you have talented people from around the world fighting, doing their best to meet your needs. 
and increasing the value of your paycheck in the process. So when the, when the market's open, you get a raise every single day, but even that doesn't get to the true beauty of open markets to trade. What makes it unrelentingly spectacular is that it maximizes the possibility that you'll get to do the work that most elevates your unique skills and intelligence. Think about what life is like here at Clemson. I assume there is a class or, or a form of study that you cannot stand, that kind of brings out the weaknesses within you. Well, that's the beauty of free trade. It just means that you can focus on what you love doing and allowing others to do for you what you can't stand doing. Everyone in this room is great at something. Most things. When your markets are open, you get to focus on what you're doing, what you're great at, and let others who are doing what they're great at meet your needs. And that's why rich countries are invariably open to foreign goods, because odds are people are doing what they do best and exchanging with others doing what they do best. And so those are the four main governmental barriers to prosperity. And to put a finer point on them, I'll bring in Henry Hazlitt's essential quote from his book, um, Economics in One Lesson. In it, he wrote, quote, what is harmful or disastrous to an individual must be equally harmful or disastrous to the collection of individuals that make up a nation. I would argue that this is the most important statement ever written in any economics book ever written. And it's one that if you internalize, I guarantee you, you will never ever again lose an economics debate. Because what Hazlitt was saying is that an economy is not some living, breathing blob that you can touch. An economy is just a collection of individuals. And when you break the economy down to the individual, you can then see why economic growth is so blindingly simple. Because I don't care what your ideology is. You could be Republican, Democrat, anarchist, libertarian, communist, socialist. What you cannot deny is that on an individual level, no individual is improved economically if more and more of the dollars earned are being taken away in taxes. No individual is able to create more wealth if more and more of the hours worked are spent complying with regulations. No individual is improved economically if the dollars earned are constantly being devalued by the U.S. Treasury. And no individual is able to take in more wealth if talented people from around the world are barred from serving their needs solely because they live in another country, such that tariffs are erected in front of them. And so economic growth is exceedingly simple when looked at through the prism of the individual, and it also works well in consideration of the, of the topic for tonight. Uh, some would say I've got the unenviable task of explaining to you why soaring wealth inequality is actually a beautiful thing, but it's easy to make this case when you look at it through the prism of the individual. Because as individuals, we all know that we're relentlessly and endlessly searching for inequality. We're always looking for what makes us uniquely great. I mean, let me ask you two, two rhetorical questions. You don't even need to raise your hand because I know the answer. How many of you will be better off if upon graduation from Clemson, you're forced into the kind of work that has nothing to do with your skill set, such that you wake up on Monday mornings shaking with dread because you're no, you know you're about to go to a workplace that will humiliate you so, does, so little does the work uh, elevate your unique talents. Conversely, how many of you will be worse off in life if you graduate into the kind of work that you can't wait to get to on Monday because you're going to do a job that makes you a superstar, that you're, you're the best at your company, you're the best at your industry at what you do. It's a reminder that as individuals, we're all searching for what makes us uniquely great, what makes us unequal. And looking at it in the bigger picture, let's ask a basic question. Is the, is the NFL worse off because Tom Brady and Deshaun Watson are much better passers than Case Keenum and, and Matt Schaub? No, the NFL is made great by the unequal. No one would watch the NFL if all the players were equal. It's the stars that elevate the league. Thinking about golf, Tiger Woods won the Masters again last April. Um, interesting about him is that when he turned professional in the late 1990s, he established a level of dominance that the sport had never seen. And add, added to that, he was kind of a surly guy, very arrogant, yet the players loved him, and they loved him because even though he was kicking the hell out of them all over every golf course, 
he was making them all rich in the process. So much did the fan interest in golf surge thanks to Tiger Woods that the, the pay packages soared. And so even though these players were coming in second, third, fourth, fifth, and 20th, they were earning at a level that they never had before. So they loved this guy. One person elevated the sport above all others. Looking at this in even bigger picture, do all of you go to bed at night in the fetal position thinking it's just not fair that Jeff Bezos has made it possible for me to buy the world's plenty all with the click of a mouse at prices that fall all the time? And then let's think about this locally. Are any of you mad and just furious because Deshaun Watson in a few years will sign an NFL contract that will be in the $100 million plus range? Is, is that unfair to you? Do some of you hate Dabo Sweeney because he earns 11 million plus per year? Is that, is that a source of anger to you at night? The reality is, is because of Dabo Sweeney, your Clemson degree is infinitely more valuable to you and will open infinitely more doors going forward because of what he's done. Not to mention what a palace this campus has become. I visited here in 1998 as a college student. I can't believe what Clemson's become. One man transformed a school in ways that, 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 that are just unreal. It's a reminder that inequality and the unequal are what make life great. Without them, life would be unrelentingly bleak. Yet as is well known right now, inequality is under attack. Politicians, pundits, economists offer evidence-free assertions that politicians must step in and shrink the great, the great around us. They must uh, neuter the unequal because unless they do, society will be torn asunder. I'm here to make a case tonight that the opposite is true, that the more the wealth gap between the rich and poor increases, the better off we all are. The better odds all of you will have of pursuing the path in life that makes it most likely that you'll get to be unequal yourself. And then some of you want to pursue a path of, of nonprofit work, of helping those who can't help themselves. Your odds of doing that, of truly helping people around the world, will greatly improve the more that the gap between the rich and poor increases. And so to start making my case, I'll begin because I explain everything through people you know rather than charts you've never heard of. I'll start with Paris Hilton. Uh, most of you know who she is. You know that she's not famous, she's infamous. We all know why she's infamous. And many who would agree with me broadly about free markets frequently make the point that when it comes to Paris Hilton, she's got too much money that she doesn't know what to do with. And so it's a good thing between the million she earns based on her notoriety, not to mention what she potentially will get in inheritance, it's probably a good thing that government steps in and shrinks what she has through the estate tax. She's got too much money, thank goodness for politicians. To which I say, when you make that argument, you make my argument for getting rid of the estate tax altogether. It's the people who have way too much money that they don't know what to do with who drive progress. And that's true whether they earned it or inherited it. Because think about Paris Hilton, precisely because she's got all, these, all this money, she can't realistically spend it in one place. And that's the genius of people like her. So let's say she puts it in a bank. Well, banks aren't paying Paris Hilton for her deposits so that they can stare lovingly at her dollars. When she puts the money in the bank, it's immediately loaned out to people who need a small business loan, who need a student loan, who need a car loan. When Paris Hilton gets to keep what's hers, we all get instant access to it. Let's say she becomes more aggressive. She wants to um, invest it in the stock market because she wants a higher return. If so, brilliant. That means that we all get raises thanks to Paris Hilton getting to keep what's hers. Think about it. Inve companies take in money, investment dollars, to enhance the work product of their workers. It allows them to back them with better equipment, better technology. So the more productive our workers, the higher is their pay. Paris Hilton gets to keep what her, what's hers, we all get raises. Let's say she becomes even more aggressive and puts the money into a private equity fund or a venture capital fund. If so, wonderful. That means her wealth is being redistributed to companies desperately in need of capital in order to survive and revive themselves. Or in the case of venture capital, it means her wealth is being directed toward a future Amazon, a future Facebook, a future Snapchat that one of you might start or work for. 
Simply put, if you want to spread the wealth of the rich around, let them hold on to every single penny of it, unless they are quite literally stuffing it under a mattress. When the rich get to keep what's theirs, whether they've earned it or inherited it, we all get to access it as though it's ours in the marketplace. Now, taking this to, in, in the, to, the next, to the next level on this, it's important inherited wealth and wealth means to progress. Specifically, it's worthwhile to travel once again back in time to the 1970s. It's but back in the 1970s, television was awful. Uh, TV back then was watched not on flat screens, but on, on box-shaped contraptions. And this is the ultimate dad humor, but they were called idiot boxes back then because, you know, the quality of television was so awful. And it was, there were some good shows, but mostly it was awful, and it was because there were only three TV stations back then, ABC, CBS, NBC. There was no Fox. There was PBS. If you lived in a large market like Los Angeles, there were a few local stations. But because there was so little competition for your eyeballs, the quality of TV was awful. Now, amid this vast wasteland, ESPN was incorporated in 1979. But it should be stressed that ESPN was a complete joke. It was a laugh line. Its headquarters was about the size of this room, and the desks were not this, but plywood borrowed from next door that employees nailed to walls so they could work on. ESPN's live sports programming back then was not the NFL or college football or the NBA. In fact, it was men's fencing, women's field hockey. That's all they could afford. ESPN's founder, Bill Rasmussen, borrowed $9,000 against his Visa card just to pay bills and to make payroll. ESPN nearly died in 1980. And then the Getty Oil Trust came along. And so what's, what's the Getty Oil Trust? Well, John Paul Getty was the richest American in the late 1950s, and when he died in 1976, he left behind a huge estate to his heirs. And they were looking to diversify out of the oil investments that he largely left them, and so they took a flyer on ESPN, $10 million, and they transformed the rest is history. ESPN became what it was thanks to this crucial infusion of inherited wealth. Thank goodness for inherited wealth. Now, some would agree, but frequently what I'm told upon saying that is that's just a ridiculous assertion. To the Gettys, $10 million was nothing. It's still important for politicians to break up these big estates. We can't have all this dynastic wealth forming around the country. Uh, to which I say, when you make that argument, you are making my argument for me for getting rid of the estate tax altogether. Because you're pointing out something crucial about the Gettys that's a reminder of how important, how essential the rich are to progress. The Gettys had $10 million to lose. Think about it. For the typical American, it hurts to lose $10,000 on an investment. And so as a consequence, most Americans, when they invest, they buy established companies. McDonald's, Procter & Gamble, Nike, Disney. Companies with predictable earning streams. There's nothing wrong with this. This is called wealth preservation. It's what most people do. But economic progress is driven by risk. It's driven by surprise. It's driven by investment and promising ideas that nine times out of ten will fail, but when, it's, when the, the idea succeeds, life is transformed. Crucial here is that only the rich can invest in these ideas because they have the money to lose. And so you look throughout history, and inherited wealth has been so essential to progress. J.P. Morgan was the son of a very rich banker. And so he had tons of money to lose, and so he was put together with Thomas Edison, this oddball inventor. Thomas Edison had this light bulb contraption that he wanted to bring to market. And J.P. Morgan backed him. His father thought he was nuts. But imagine life before the light bulb. Howard Hughes inherited Hughes Tool and Die in Houston and brought this massive pile out of, of money out to Southern California and funded the rise of the U.S. aviation industry that enables us to fly around the world. Uh, imagine life without that. I assume some of you have Apple products. Rockefeller wealth was what created Apple. That's what, that's what they, that's what, what they, who invested in Apple on the way to that transformation. Silicon Valley, 
imagine our lives without all the advances there. Well, the original funders of Silicon Valley venture capitalists were families with the names like, once again, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Phipps. Families so rich that they had enormous amounts of money they could lose on investments that failed nine out of ten times. And that's still true today. And so you think about ESPN, thank goodness inherited wealth saved it. But ask yourself the question, how many great companies never made it out of the cradle given this odd need within people to take away, to tax away the wealth of the rich, whether earned or inherited, what have we lost? What's the unseen loss given this need among politicians to shrink the super rich? Now taking this further, it's important to recognize what inequality means in a country like the United States. Uh, we are different. Uh, Professor Thompson and I were talking about this earlier. Americans basically descend from the crazies. We descend from the people who crossed oceans and borders desperate to taste freedom. The poorest people in the world came to the United States to better themselves. And I always bring this up because it's an inconvenient truth to those who say, well, inequality and rich people hurt the poor people. Well, a poor person would never acknowledge what's laughable because the poor, the U.S. is easily the most unequal country on earth. Now, people can bring up Luxembourg and certain places, Monaco, but we are the most unequal country on earth, and the world's poorest routinely risk their lives to this day to get here because they know where rich people are is where the opportunity is. And when people come here, they don't go to the poorest cities and states, they go to the richest, where there are achievers, opportunity is endless, an inconvenient truth. Added to that, think about what we are once again as Americans. We're these people who, who risked everything to get a taste of economic and personal freedom. It's a reminder that wealth and inequality does not bother us. We don't go into the fetal position at night because someone's got more than we do. To Americans in particular, but I submit to you this is true around the world, inequality is a spur to greatness. We see someone who's achieved and we look at it and we think, I want to be like that person. And so it causes us to gamble on new ideas. I use lots of examples in popular economics, but my favorite involves someone many of you have probably never heard of, uh, the late Al Newharth. Uh, Newharth, in a newspaper column he wrote a few years before he died, described his early life, and I only lightly paraphrase. As he put it about himself, quote, I was a poor German-Russian kid from South Dakota. My dad died when I was two. Now, Newhart's column was about himself and Larry King, a, a still alive talk show host. Larry King grew up in Brooklyn, New York, incredibly impoverished circumstances. He, his father died when he was in grade school. And as Newhart went on to point out, Larry and I both knew that we were going to have to gamble on some big ideas in order to make it big time. Larry gambled on a late night talk show that became CNN's Larry King Live. I gambled on USA Today in 1982. It became the nation's newspaper. Now, I, I was never a big fan of Larry King. I can't live without USA Today. I read it to this day, cover to cover. It's very small, sadly, but that's not the point. I bring this up as an example to remind you that in the United States, it does not matter who you are. It does not matter who your parents are. It doesn't matter how much money your parents had. It doesn't matter where you went to school. Larry King didn't get a college degree. The only thing that matters in the United States is your willingness to back what is true about you, what elevates you uniquely with all the energy you have. Now what's important about this is that absent investment, your vision, your dream will just be that and it will always remain that. And so remember this the next time someone says to you, we've got to tax the rich, they need to pay their fair share, they need to give back something through government. You're not harming Rockefellers or Gates or Bezoses, but what you are harming are the dreamers who have big ideas but can only turn them into something real with investment. Those people who have too much money that they know what to do with, those are the people who drive progress because they can uniquely make bets on the biggest dreamers of all. If you go after the rich, you go after those who aren't rich but who have big dreams. Now taking this further, let's just ask the basic question. What does rising wealth inequality mean in a free country like the United States? Specifically, it means that the lifestyle gap between the rich and poor is rapidly shrinking. 
If any of you are wondering how to get rich quickest in a country like this, mass produce the former luxuries of the rich. Take what the rich enjoy uniquely and mass produce it. Getting into closer detail, if any of you are curious how the poor and middle class in the United States will live in the not too distant future. The single best way to understand that is to travel to the richest cities in the United States and observe the lifestyle habits of the richest of the rich. That is the best evidence or that's the best information about how we'll all live in the future if markets remain free. Getting even more specific to all of you, let's ask the question, what do the rich get to do that most of us don't? Now there's lots of examples, but arguably my, my, maybe the most obvious one is the rich fly in private jets. When we fly, for the most part, we, uh, we're dealing with TSA. We're going to airports. Well, so here's the good news to, for all of you, and remember where you heard it. Within the next 10 to 15 years, private flight's going to be something, kind of a ho-hum thing for all of you been there, done that. Some friend will show up to visit and say, ooh, I flew private, and you'll secretly think, oh, please, I've done that so many times. Your kids, when they're sitting in these seats, that's all they'll ever know. Private flight will be the norm. It's what we all do. Now, some of you may ask, how can this clown say something so absurd? Furthermore, he just said the future is, is hard to predict. Why does he know this? Well, I know this because history is very clear that what the rich enjoy is always and everywhere a preview of what we'll all enjoy if the economy remains free. Think once again about those smartphones that all of you have. And think back to 1983. That was when Motorola first manufactured the first mobile phone. It was brick-sized, had a half hour of battery life. Reception was terrible. If you wanted to make a call on it from Clemson to Charleston, it was going to cost you a fortune. If you wanted to own this pathetic looking primitive phone, it was going to cost you $3,995. Not to mention what it was going to cost you to call on that. Well, nowadays, thanks to people who made billions in the process, we've got supercomputers sitting in our pockets that, among countless other things, we can call on and we pay next to nothing for, for these phones that are exponentially more powerful uh, and we pay next to nothing just if we, if we sign a deal with, with, with an AT&T or Verizon. What about the computers you all have? Well, IBM manufactured the first mainframe in, 19, in the 1960s. Uh, the most primitive of these filled a room bigger than this and if you wanted to own it, it was going to cost you well over a million dollars. Well, there are billionaires on this earth nowadays who got that way because nowadays they've made computers so cheap that we can buy them next to nothing and we, when we get tired of them, we just throw them away. Think about the automobile. When the 20th century began, cars were rarer than millionaires and millionaires were incredibly rare. If you had a car, you were stunningly rich. If you knew someone who had a car, you ran in the highest of circles. And then Henry Ford got to work mass producing this former luxury and became very rich in the process. Now importantly, these cars were powered by gasoline brought to market by John D. Rockefeller, the richest person who ever lived. Now Rockefeller's story is particularly interesting when you consider his first fortune was in kerosene. It used to be that when night fell, the day ended, just went pitch black and that was it. Unless you had lots of money and you could burn candles that didn't burn bright to begin with, you went to bed at night. There was nothing to do. So Rockefeller got rich by quite literally lighting up the night and then trained his genius on mass and bringing a refined gasoline to power the cars that increasingly got people around. To be very clear, rising wealth inequality does not cause poverty. In fact, it is the greatest enemy poverty has ever known. Because when, when inequality is soaring, that's the surest sign that the needs of the poor and middle class are being taken care of and that all the discomforts they're used to are being erased by entrepreneurs. Now in popular economics, of course, I use lots of sports examples. As you know, I do so because I believe in a football stadium or an arena, there are no Democrats, Republicans, anarchists, socialists, what you name it, there are just fans. And so think about what that means to you as Clemson Tiger fans. Um, every time Trevor Lawrence is tackled in uncomfortable fashion, you kind of lose your breath for a minute 
Did they, they take his knee out? Will he be out for the season? Will, be, will this end his career? Well, so what if some scientist or doctor comes up with a way to cure the ACLs, the torn ACL, such that the athlete's back on the field good as new within a day or a week? This person would assuredly be worth billions in short order. Would any, would any of you say, no, we can't have that advance. That would cause society to be more unequal. We can't have that. What if someone comes up with a cure for cancer? Would any of you say, no, we, even though this person would be worth tens of billions, would you say, no, no, we can't have that. that we, we don't, society would just become too unequal. Now, some of you might respond to that, that what I'm describing is a bridge too far that it's never going to happen. These advances are impossible, but don't be so sure about that. Never forget that when the 20th century began, it was a known quantity among deep thinkers that man would never fly. The Wright brothers were in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, trying to create an airplane, and they were a laugh line. Who are these freak shows thinking that man can fly? We know man can't do that. Going back to the Civil War era, if you went into battle and were shot in the abdomen, you were going to die. If you broke your femur back then, one in three chances of death. If you broke your hip, dead. If you got cancer, forget about it. There was no hope for you. Understand that until World War I, that was the first war in history that more people died from bombs and gunshots than they did from pneumonia. Pneumonia used to be the biggest killer of all. And so when you say that we can't achieve these things, history disproves that. And so again, I ask the question, if someone comes up with a cure for paralysis, would you say no because someone might get rich for doing it? Again, what about cancer? Because see, there's a billionaire in Los Angeles named Patrick Soon Xiong, and he got that way by creating the drug Abrixane, which is bringing us closer and closer, at least giving us a fair fight against pancreatic cancer, which used to be a certain killer. And so think about the question. At which point, let's just ask a basic, some basic questions that you can raise your hands on this. Um, how many of you own an Apple product? Okay, how many of you own a Nike product? Uh, how many of you have purchased something on Amazon in the past month? Okay, so Steve Jobs died worth what, 10 Founder Phil Knight worth 30 billion plus. Jeff Bezos, even after the divorce, worth over 100 billion. W would any of you say to me with a straight face that you wished they hadn't achieved what they did, that you wish they'd gone on the dole because society would be more equal? My sense is that even those of you who will visibly and verbally disagree with me, that in private you'd admit to me that you'd love for a hundred Jeff Bezos, a hundred Steve Jobs, because imagine our living standards if there were more of them. And that's the point of all this. I want that too. I'm a big believer in the profit motive and everything, and, but you can only get to that. You can only get to this stage by matching more and more dreamers with capital. And we're able to do that to a much higher degree, the less we have this odd, just so backwards vision that it's the job of politicians to neuter the rich, to shrink what they have and redistribute it in unwise fashion. Leave that wealth in the private sector where it can be matched with tomorrow's Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos. And so as you can see, obviously I'm a strong believer in, in, in the profit motive and all that it brings, but I'll end my talk with the story of a company and a brand that, sort of, that hopefully reminds you how compassionate all of this is, inequality is. Specifically, I want to talk about Coca-Cola. Uh, from 1981 to 1997, Roberto Gozueda ran Coke as its CEO focusing wholly on, pro on profits for shareholders. The, he, this was not some touchy-feely guy talking about all the jobs we create and all the nice, uh, nice civic uh, responsibilities we have in Atlanta. His focus was on enriching his shareholders. But thank goodness for Roberto Guzueta. Because thanks to the huge surge in the value of Coca-Cola shares, Emory University now is one of the largest endowments in the world, such that it can give out endless annual scholarships uh, to needy students on an annual basis. The Robert Woodruff Foundation, the Woodruffs were the original founders of Coca-Cola, is able to give away hundreds of millions of dollars a year to Atlanta charities uh, focused on um, beautifying the city. And then maybe most appealing of all from a human interest standpoint is the story of, of a former pediatrician named Bill Warren, 
Warren was born and inherited a fair amount of Coke shares that weren't worth very much. And then, uh, so he became a pediatrician. And then during the Goizueta years, saw the value of his shares surge. He became so rich that he was able to shut down the pediatric practice altogether and focus the rest of his life on helping Atlanta's inner city families with their medical struggles. All of this was possible thanks to one man who totally revolutionized the company. Now, Goizueta died in cancer in 1997. Um, he died nearly a billionaire. But would anyone in this room look at me with a straight face and say, I wish he hadn't done that. I wish that Coca-Cola was still worth the $4 billion it was when he arrived as opposed to the $145 billion when he died because, you know, we'd be more, more equal. Never forget what rising wealth inequality means. It's a moral concept because it's about freedom. The freer the people, the more unequal they are simply because they're able to pursue the path in life that most elevates what's brilliant about them. And that's what most, that's most importantly what it comes down to. I can talk to you for days about the, the societal benefits that come from people growing rich. It's just so easy. But ultimately, this is about individuals. When people are free, they get to pursue what makes them uniquely great, and so it's about happiness. And so let's not give in on this argument. Uh, but Republicans and Democrats have become so, have treat inequality as some sort of bad thing. Let's change the discussion and say, no, this is a wonderful thing. It's a sign of a progressing society. Uh, thank you very much. I was just wondering, you said, I'm sure you're all confused. What point? As a lecturer of yours, has somebody taken the most issue with it? How did you deal with that? Like, has there ever been a heated debate with somebody in the audience and how did you? It's a great question because people always ask, they say, oh wow, the students must hate this lecture. And I say, no, they don't. I, I've never, I've, I don't buy in my next book that all of you should buy several copies of. I, I make, I have a chapter about American campuses. I don't buy that they're all crazy left-wing socialists. I've, I've generally had good response to this. There was one girl at Oklahoma State several years ago who wouldn't shake my hand. Um, what I frequently get is that, hey, wait a second, these people are becoming so rich that they control markets in ways such that uh, it's going to suffocate others coming up, to which I say there's really no evidence supporting such a claim. Uh, what we find throughout history is that, is that monopolies, A, they're a beautiful thing. If you're going to get into business, I hope it's because you want to meet the needs of people that have never been met before. So monopoly is something to cheer on. Wow, some business figured out a way, found something that had not been taken care of in the marketplace and owns the market. But what we find throughout history is monopolies attract imitators and people who figure out ways to do things better and better. Never forget, we're seeing Sears implode before our eyes right now. Sears used to be looked at as a company that could not be beat. People said, we've got to shrink them. Uh, they were the Amazon of their time. Uh, never forget that GM in the 1960s, economists were saying that if, if government doesn't step in and shrink this monopoly, soon enough GM will own the whole car market. Well, how'd that work out? In 2008, they ran to the government for a bailout. What we find is that giants invariably stumble. And so never, there, there's no such thing as a free market monopoly. There is for a time, again, thank goodness. But inevitably, someone comes in and, and discovers something that, that the successful business didn't, and they take them out. And so you want that soaring wealth because, again, what can the rich do with it? Precisely because they've got so much of it, they have no choice but to invest it. And so they, in many ways, set the stage for their demise because in, innovators, dreamers get an idea that puts them out. Rest assured, in your lifetime, Amazon will probably go out of business. Amazing as that sounds, Amazon's not for long, and it could be your generation, someone in your generation that takes it out. Um, you said fairly early on that an increase in taxation leads to a decrease in our freedom because it's people like the politicians that are making these decisions for us um, about how the money is being allocated, rather than people like Jeff Bezos is the example you gave. But for the non-Jeff Bezoses of the world, how does that actually help us with, I guess, the term freedom sort of threw me. If he holds on to it, 
it's not gonna, he's not gonna stuff it under a mattress. If he puts it in the bank, the bank's gonna decide where it goes. It's gonna lend it out to the best lending opportunities. If he puts it in the stock market, it's going to be directed to all sorts of businesses in ways that enhance um, how they can, they can do their, their job. Bezos was one of the investors in Google one of the early investors in Google. One of the, Bezos was a principal investor and is uh, in Uber. Imagine life without that. Uh, the beauty of someone like Bezos is he freely admits most of his, his ideas fail. Most of his ideas that he pr pursues at Amazon do not work. And that was true for Bill Gates, the former richest man in the world. As he, as he put, out, put it, 90% of my ideas don't work. And so Bezos not only invests in himself, but he invests in new businesses. And so compare that to a politician. Uh, politicians, as a rule, are going to politicize the allocation of this precious wealth. Uh, Warren Buffett may be a great investor, but if he were an investor, if he were a senator, he would be a terrible investor. And he would because with government, failure is not allowed. Think about it. Bad ideas in government last forever. We still have the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, nearly 100 years after it was created unnecessarily. In the free market, bad ideas die quickly. Um, Silicon Valley is a monument to failed ideas. Just about every business out there fails, and that's where you get progress. With government, an idea that fails, we just keep giving it more money. In the private sector, that idea goes away. We learn from it and try something new. And so uh, the loss of progress is staggering. Um, I submit to all of you that if, if government had not been as large as it is for decades, that we wouldn't even be talking about cancer right now. And we'd already have those private jets that we want. Uh, government spending slows the experimentation that enables progress. One of the comments you made earlier is that the beauty of inequality is that everyone in this room can look at someone like Jeff Bezos and say, well, I want to be distinguished like that person is. Um, but I'm wondering if you could address recent trends in something like social mobility. Um, for most of the people here today and most of the people at this school, we are in a way the elite. We're at a top 25 university in the United States. Um, I can't make this statement broadly about all students, but most of the students here are from the middle or upper, upper class and not from the lower classes. Um, and some of the trends we're seeing lately is a decline in social mobility for people in lower classes. SAT score is more and more correlated with your socioeconomic status. If you're living in a poor com community, you have less and less access to good education. Uh, education and student loans are skyrocketing. Um, it just seems as if for people who are not in the position that we are, it's maybe not as simple as saying, look at someone like Jeff Bezos and be distinguished as them. They might not have the opportunity that the rest of us have. Uh, is that, could you address that? Is that something that maybe complicates Great your argument? Great point question. It's, it, it's, yes, as, as Matt said, you're going to a top school, a uh, very desirable school to go to, and so you are the, the elite. But never forget the poorest people in the world still risk their lives to come here. Be, and, and they're not coming here because there's no mobility. Now, there's no doubt there's these poor neighborhoods full of people, uh, many of whom don't speak English, and they may not, they, they, don't, they don't, won't necessarily see a way up, but relative to how they lived before they got to the United States, their productivity has surged, their, their living standards have surged, and their kids have a chance. Uh, good point about SAT scores and access to education. Uh, there's a correlation between SAT scores and success. Is it causation? I don't think so. Um, I, I think, I, let me stress, I think the fact that you're here is brilliant. But nothing you'll learn in school is what's going to make you successful later on in life. Uh, your hard work is what will make you successful. Uh, what's going to make you successful is finding something um, that, is, that uniquely elevates you and pursuing that. Uh, school cannot do that for you. And so I, uh, and you look at China as an example. China was built, uh, Professor Thompson and I were talking about this earlier, t earlier today. Take a city like Shanghai, there's a point to this about education. Shanghai in 1978 had 12 tall buildings that you'd sc call skyscrapers. As of 2006, it had 3,780. Um, as of today, I think that number is easily probably 9,000 or 10,000. China's one of the least educated countries in the world. 
Uh, most of the people who built this great nation or built it from up next to nothing didn't have college education. Uh, South Korea is one of the largest economies in the world. Uh, it in the 1950s and 60s was one of the most illiterate countries on earth. Freedom is what drives economic progress. N edu education in these wonderful colleges that we get to go to are a consequence of economic freedom and free people prospering. John D. Rockefeller certainly didn't have a college education. Thomas Edison, I think he was eighth grade. Um, and again, anecdote doesn't prove it, but the point is the people who built this country that made it rich, for the most part, didn't go to Harvard, but they gave money to Harvard so their kids could go there. And so you're right. Um, you're, you're coming from a very, very elite point, but never forget that if it were true there were no opportunity, then that there, there wouldn't, we wouldn't, now I don't worry about borders to begin with, but there wouldn't be talk about closing borders down because people wouldn't be coming here. The fact that they are is the surest market signal that the, the opportunity to lift yourself up is still very, very real and the American dream is still very real because if it weren't, people would be going somewhere else. And then I would just say one of the things, this is the argument of my book, The End of Work, that I'll be honest, bombed. I'm surprised that no one, but no one bought it. But the point of the book makes a case that look at how work's changed over time. 150 years ago, if you're born in the very rich United States, very rich United States, you kind of knew your path in life. As soon as you were able, you were going to work six days a week from dawn to dusk on a farm. Didn't matter if you loved it or hated it, that was your job. Now, how many of you could succeed? How many of you would be happy if you knew that after Clemson and this wondrous time that going to the farm for six days a week, do you think you'd be um, a big shot, big success? Is, would that le elevate you? And my point about that is that the ways in which people can prosper today are amazing. I mean, look, look, at, look at football just as an example. When Bill Belichick got into coaching, in the 1970s. He was a $25 a week NFL assistant. Well, as of my book's publication in 20, well, what was it, 2017, Boise State, hardly a Clemson, had a budget for just its football assistance alone of over $2 million. I don't want to begin to think what Clemson's budget is for ass assistant coaches, because Dabo Sweeney's notoriously good at paying his assistants, he wants them to stick around. Now important, okay, so Clemson's this elite football school and all this. Well, some of you are probably in the state of Georgia. When I pub, or from Georgia, when I published my book, uh, 24 high school coaches in the state of Georgia, high school, were earning in the, in the six figures. As of, so that's when the book went to print. As of publication, that number had risen to 36, so that was a year ago. I don't know what the number is now. The ways in which people can make money today. There are 20,000 Fortnite coaches in the United States. Think about it. When I was growing up, if you said that you were going to be a, a video game coach, oh, come on, they would have committed you. And if you said you're going to be a video game player, you obviously had, for as a career, you obviously had a substance abuse problem. And so my point is, with this growth, the range of ways that people in, who in the past would have had their talents suffocated by a very primitive economy is exploding. And so I never feel sorry for anyone in the United States. The, yeah, are there people who've got less than you? Of course there are, but that's all, they're, they're, it's always going to be that way. But wow. Look at what, watch where people go. They still risk everything to get to the United States because the social mobility is much greater than pessimistic politicians and economists and pundits would want you to believe. Um, we're worried about the fact that our defense industry might become entirely dependent upon components for the things it makes from the Chinese in certain places. In certain places. Um, what do we make of that fact? Right? What should we do about that? on this question of the nation, right? To live in a nation means to live with a bunch of people whose lives cannot be really analogized to those either of sports stars, on the one hand, or to people whose political memory is of despotism around the world, who then come here to live a better life. They're people who have lived here for several generations, right? And remember a time in which things seemed to be more equal to them. They weren't scorned for being less intelligent, Right? They were able to work these jobs and work with their skills. 
right, and raise families, they've got one income even, right? Have never shown they wanted to have, these kinds of things. Those people, right? So the one, so on the sort of the defense angle, the national security angle, and on this angle of the middle class people, right, who feel that they are somehow in a different situation than two generations ago, what do you say to them? Huawei's in 177 different countries around the world. What we know based on that is that this, country, this company is not a creation of the state. The state could never pr create such an innovative company. And okay, they may be first to 5G. Well, thumbs up to that because guess what? I don't live in, in Cupertino and I don't live in Seattle either, but I get the benefit of Apple and, and Amazon as though I live in both those places. When your markets are open, it, it's as though everything is next door to you. Uh, I think China was a much d more dangerous threat to us when it was a poor country because they had no, no, uh, they they had they had no rooting interest in us. And I'm getting to the defense aspect of us, of this. You know, the facts are that. Uh, we're the biggest market for, the Chinese, for Chinese companies, thank goodness. Um, every day they sell things to us, the odds of them wanting to invade us logically decline. It would be economic suicide for them, but thankfully it, it works both ways. Uh, Apple sells one-fifth of its iPhones in China. Uh, Bo GM sells more cars in China than it does in North America. Boeing sells a quarter of its planes in China. There are 3,400 Starbucks in China on the way to 7,000. Uh, China's McDonald's second largest market. It's Nike's second largest market. Uh, it's the second largest market for U.S. movie producers. I think all this trade, all this exchange that has people worried is setting the stage for much better peace. Okay, and so again, let's look at defense. Apparently, we're buying some inputs for our weapons that come from China. Could they cut us off? No. They could only cut us off by ceasing to sell them. Think about it. Uh, we've got an embargo right now on, on Iran. We've got an embargo on uh, Venezuela, I suppose theoretically. But there are iPhones all over Iran. Although we're, we're not allowed to sell those iPhones to Iran, Iranians buy them from those we sell them, sell them to. That's what was so funny to, to me about, well, we're going to no longer allow Huawei to buy U.S. components for its, its movement toward 5G. Oh, good luck with that, because unless Broadcom and these companies stop, start, stop selling them all together, the Chinese will just buy from whom we sell to. You think back to 1973, people have always said, well, oil is it's a national security issue. We've got to be oil energy independent. Oh, please. You go back to 1973, OPEC put an embargo on us. We still bought every bit as much uh, OPEC oil as we did before. We just bought it from those they sold it to. You go back to the 19th century, um, and th this gets even more in defense. Um, England was at war with just about every European power at one point during the 19th century. Yet it was still buying all sorts of stuff from those countries, still trading with those countries. G go back to the, er to the, to the early uh, 20th century, the US, is at, at the U.S. embargoes Germany and uh, suddenly our producer's not allowed to trade with Germany. Yet out of nowhere, trade, U.S. exports to Scandinavian countries surged. Well, what happened? Oh, we were just trading with the Germans through the Scandinavian countries. And so the Chinese, assuming they're creating things that we need for our weapons, we're gonna get those no matter what, unless they wanna shut down altogether. Um, I, so I just, I think it's, to me, the China story is a beautiful one. And I think the more that we're exchanging with one another, the better off we are, the safer we are. Um, it terrifies me, it saddens me that so many people, so many freedom types have said, well, we disagree with Trump on every tariff except for the ones with China because they're our enemy. No, I think we're enemies with countries that we're not exchanging with. And so that's the first thing in terms of inequality. Um, I've heard that argument that, oh yeah, people are, people are frustrated. I submit to you that the problem now is that inequality hasn't surged quickly enough. Uh, because I don't, the inequality surged in the 80s and 90s, but I don't remember the electorate as unhappy as they are today. 
and it's my contention that when inequality is surging, once again, that's a sign that lifestyle is just going through the roof for the typical person. But remember also, so is opportunity. I mean, ask yourself the question, how many of you people know someone who told you recently, yeah, or how many people are, of you are moving to West Virginia after college? Uh, is, that, is that a plan? Is that a big destination for any of you? Um, a lot of you moving to Detroit after college? Is that, is that, is it, you know, complete rate? Where do people move? They move to where the rich people are. I guarantee there's lots of you moving to California, moving to New York, moving to Texas, moving to Atlanta. Where there are rich people, inequal, uh, opportunities endless because, you know, they're the ones innovating and everything. And so I, I really do believe, and I've put out op-eds about this, which means nothing, but it's just my response to you, is that inequality hasn't soared qu quickly enough in the 21st century. Um, I would tie that to a falling U.S. dollar, which would put all of you to sleep, but I think uh, sadly, both political parties vastly understate the importance of a dollar that holds its value throughout time. And I think it's massively driven down investment in innovators in the 21st century and slowed the growth of inequality. And that has people frustrated as hell. They just don't know why they're frustrated.